Hell Up in Harlem, a 1973 action film, is a roller coaster ride of a movie that takes you through the life of Tommy Gibbs, a tough guy who becomes the king of Harlem. Fred Williamson plays the lead role with such energy that it's hard not to get drawn into Tommy's world. The movie is packed with scenes that will make you laugh, jump, and maybe even shed a tear. It's a film that has stood the test of time, and Fred Williamson's performance is a big reason why. I remember watching it for the first time years ago, and it was as entertaining as it is today. Now, I'd like to know, who was your favorite actor in this classic film? And do you remember the first time you watched Hell Up in Harlem? What was that experience like for you? Share your most memorable moments or personal experiences related to this movie in the comments. We're excited to read about your stories and memories connected to this unforgettable film. The 1973 movie Hell Up in Harlem was well received for its action-packed storyline and became a notable film of its time. It contributed to the black exploitation genre, which was popular in the 1970s. This genre was known for featuring African-American actors in lead roles and often dealt with themes relevant to the African-American community. The movie's success led to the creation of related products like posters and soundtracks which were popular among fans. Although Hell Up in Harlem did not have direct spin-offs, it influenced other films in the genre and is remembered for its strong characters and exciting plot. Its style and themes can be seen in later movies and shows that draw inspiration from the black exploitation era. Before his acting career took off, Fred Williamson was a professional football player, having competed in the first Super Bowl in 1967 as part of the Kansas City Chiefs. His transition from sports to cinema included a project titled Snowballs in 1984, which he started filming in Canada under the direction of Ray Arsenal Lieutenant. Despite the initial announcement in Variety, there is no record of the film's completion or release. Williamson's athletic prowess was not limited to one team. He was traded to the Chiefs and played against the Green Bay Packers, showcasing his skills on the field during the very first Super Bowl. Fred Williamson, after his time in the spotlight, settled on a family ranch in New Mexico. His athletic background is notable, with a history in football at Northwestern University and a mastery of martial arts, holding black belts in Kenpo, Shotokan Karate, and Taekwondo. These skills not only shaped his sports career, but also contributed to his dynamic presence on screen. Fred Williamson earned his nickname Hammer from his football days, reflecting his reputation for delivering hard hits. His presence in the film industry was marked by this same toughness. In a notable step for her career, Mindy Miller made her first credited appearance in film alongside Williamson, with whom she shared a personal relationship during the time of production. Adding to his bold persona, Williamson was featured in a revealing photo shoot for Playgirl magazine's October issue in the same year, showcasing a different side of the actor known for his on-field and on-screen strength. After completing his education at Froebel High School and Northwestern University, Fred Williamson embarked on a film career that led him to a project where efficiency was key. During the production of a certain action film, director Larry Cohen faced the challenge of maximizing resources. He cleverly utilized the same crew and equipment from another project, It's Alive, to shoot scenes for this film. Due to Williamson's busy schedule, a stand-in performed most of the on-screen action, with Williamson himself only available for close-up shots. These crucial shots were captured in Los Angeles, while the rest of the movie was filmed in the bustling streets of New York, bringing an authentic urban backdrop to the story. Fred Williamson Known for his strong and silent film personas, chose not to spoof his own image in the comedy I'm Gonna Get You Sucka. His decision reflected a desire to maintain the integrity of the tough characters he portrayed in the 1970s. In a dramatic turn of events on screen, Bobby Ramson's character meets his end in a unique and darkly humorous manner, with a hot dog playing a pivotal role in the scene. The demand for a follow-up to the successful film Black Caesar led to a challenging production schedule. With Williamson and director Larry Cohen committed to other projects during the weekdays, the sequel's filming was relegated to weekends, showcasing the dedication and resourcefulness of the cast and crew to bring the project to fruition. In the process of creating a follow-up to a successful film, the production team faced challenges with cast cooperation. Director Larry Cohen had to employ unconventional methods, including staging scenes without actual filming, to manage actors Dierbo Martin and Tony King, who were not adhering to his directions. King's dual role included a brief appearance as a subway commuter, showcasing Cohen's adaptability. 
The urgency to capitalize on the predecessor's success led to the rapid development of the sequel, commissioned by the studio head immediately after the initial film's positive reception, resulting in a swift release just months later. In a twist of events during production, James Brown, initially set to score the film, had his music turned down by director Larry Cohen. Instead, Motown's Edwin Starr stepped in to provide the soundtrack, while Brown's compositions found a place in his album The Payback. Meanwhile, Fred Williamson, who starred in the film, later appeared as a judge at the Miss Universe pageant in 1976, showcasing his versatility beyond acting. A notable behind-the-scenes moment occurred during a scene with Tommy climbing a ladder amidst the Times Square billboards, where a cameraman narrowly avoided a mishap by catching a falling camera lens, ensuring the shot was captured without incident. In the midst of action and drama, certain scenes stand out for their portrayal of racial themes. Notably, a lavish meal scene displays traditional soul food, while another poignant moment occurs with a character's demise beside a Lincoln statue, witnessed by two young children. Additionally, the film shares a connection with Live, and let die through the casting of Gloria Hendry and Julius Harris, albeit without shared screen time. Behind the scenes, director Larry Cohen has expressed that the production faced significant challenges due to a lack of preparation. In a decisive move by the head of American International Pictures, the sequel to Black Caesar was given a distinct title, avoiding confusion as its predecessor was still showing in cinemas. The production kicked off with an incomplete script, adding a layer of challenge from day one. Adding to the list of oversights, the credits mistakenly listed Charles McGuire for the role of Hap, a character actually portrayed by Charles McGregor, an error that went unnoticed by the production company. Before his acting career, Fred Williamson was a professional football player in the Canadian Football League. His background also includes training as an architect. The film's initial score was composed by James Brown, who had previously created the music for Black Caesar. However, due to a prior disagreement with American International Pictures over another movie score, Brown's work was not used for this film. Instead, he adapted the music into what became his successful album, The Payback. This album, originally intended for the film soundtrack, became one of his best-selling records. In the late 1970s, Fred Williamson was cast in an Italian film project titled Two in the Stars, which began production, but there's no record of its completion. During the filming of a fight scene on an airplane for another project, Williamson's strength was on full display when he accidentally dislodged an opponent's shoes, which he then disposed of in a quick, unscripted moment. Off-screen, Williamson shared a friendship with actor Deerville Martin, known for his work in cinema during that era. 